Good afternoon. I'm Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center. Thank you for joining today's Atlantic Council front page with Prime Minister Philip Davis of the Bahamas and current chair of CARICOM. To begin our program, I would like to turn to Adrian Arst, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of both the Adrian Arst Latin America Center and the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Adrian? Good afternoon, and welcome to the Atlantic Council's front page, the Atlantic Council's premier platform for world leaders tackling today's greatest challenges. As Jason said, I'm Adrian Arsht, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. I'm delighted to welcome to our virtual and in-person the guests who are here for this pivotal conversation with the Honorable Philip Davis, the Prime Minister of the Bahamas and the current chair of the Caribbean community. Mr. Prime Minister, we are delighted to welcome you to the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center and the Caribbean Initiative's first event of the year. Thank you for joining us during your first trip to Washington. I'm so glad that the Caribbean Initiative is part of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. Since its founding, the work of the initiative has ensured that Caribbean priorities and ideas are incorporated into the broader mission of the center. Melanie, I commend you for your vision and thank you for bringing the Caribbean Initiative to the Atlantic Council. Prime Minister Davis's visit comes at the start of what is expected to be an important year for U.S.-Caribbean relations. As climate change continues to batter Caribbean nations and as their economies suffer the consequences of rising global inflation, working hand in hand with U.S. partners is more important than ever before. Prime Minister, we look forward to your insights on the path ahead for these relations. But first, I would like to introduce Atlantic Council board member and founder of the Caribbean Initiative, Melanie Chen, to provide some framing remarks. Melanie? Thank you, Adrian. When I founded the Caribbean Initiative, it was my intention to ensure that Caribbean voices and perspectives were represented and heard here in Washington, and to ensure that actions move forward to advance a stronger US-Caribbean partnership and a better future for the region. Today marks the first event of the year for the Caribbean Initiative. Mr. Prime Minister, the priorities you have previously outlined for the Bahamas and the wider Karakoram region, such as energy security, addressing climate change, and improving U.S. policy to the Caribbean are critical to the health and well-being of the region. In the spirit of supporting region, regional development, many of these priorities are aligned with the work of the Caribbean Initiative this year. We have recently launched a new Caribbean Energy Working Group and will continue to address the challenges associated with financial de-risking at the inaugural U.S. Caribbean Banking Forum that will take place this year. We will also work with U.S. and Caribbean stakeholders to build roadmaps that ensure that the benefits promised by PAC 2030 become a reality. Your vision for the region and for the Bahamas is crucial to underscoring the important role the Caribbean plays in our hemisphere. Prime Minister Davis, this is why I'm honored that you have come to the Atlantic Council in your capacity as both Prime Minister of the Bahamas and as Chair of the Caragom community. Prime Minister Davis was elected to office in 2021 and most recently took over as Chair of Caracom this year. 
He has served as a member of parliament since 2002 and was previously deputy prime minister and minister of public works from 2012 to 2017. Prime Minister Davis has also been a leading litigation lawyer in the Caribbean, especially in the field of corporate law. He has an impressive record in the Court of Appeals with more appearances before the UK Privy Council than any other Bahamian lawyer. While in office, Prime Minister Davis has stewarded his country through the COVID-19 pandemic, the recent hurricane season, and now through global economic challenges such as riding, rising food and fuel costs. While there are challenging times still ahead for the region, I expect that the leadership Prime Minister Davis has shown in his own country will translate to his time as CARICOM chair and bring greater security and prosperity for the entire Caribbean. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Prime Minister Davis, who will provide keynote remarks before having a moderated conversation with Jason. Prime Minister Davis, over to you. Thank you very much, Melanie, to Arlene, Jason, and to the wider audience here. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you, the Atlantic Council, for all the work it has done in prioritizing strategic U.S.-Caribbean relations and providing us with this vital forum for discussing and developing solutions for our shared challenges. Within the global village, the US and the Caribbean are neighbors, and the Americas represent our community. Neighbors looking out for one another is a key ingredient to a thriving community. Within our community of nations, effective bilateral cooperation will be an engine of change that will thrust us into a new era of regional prosperity and security. The Caribbean Initiative provides an important platform for solutions as we engage in regional challenges. I applaud the Atlantic Council for providing this foundation for progressive change fueled by stronger U.S.-Caribbean relationship and ties. As we discuss various regional issues, perhaps the most pressing question that we, we must develop an answer to is, what will we do about climate change? As time runs out for preventative action, small island developing states throughout the Caribbean must come to terms with the full extent of our vulnerability. Our low-lying coastal areas are already taking a beating. We are living in a reality in which my nation saw billions of dollars in damages blown away by storms over the past few years. A reality in which, just a few years ago, Dominica lost 50% of its GDP in a single night. Increased climate resiliency is the obvious answer to our climate woes. But the financial toll taken by rising sea levels and stronger, more frequent storms makes it, make it increasingly more difficult to fund climate resilience initiatives. What we need is more access to climate change specific funding to mitigate the damage being inflicted each day. We can talk about developing our economies and promoting security all we want. But any talk of sustainable regional development must include a discussion of substantial investments in a climate resilient future for the Caribbean. Climate justice must be more than a buzzword. To avert future economic crises, to protect against future death and destruction, and to prevent a climate change-generated migrant crisis, 
a real action must be taken to equip all nations within our Caribbean community for climate resiliency. Of course, as we speak about climate resilient infrastructure, we must inevitably talk about regional energy security. We must first acknowledge that this is not a one size fits all discussion. For example, the nations of Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname and Guyana have fossil fuel reserves that will prove quite beneficial to their economies for some time. We are all at different stages in our energy production journey. But we can all agree that a move towards cleaner fuels and renewable energy are shared goals for the good of the region and the world. Across the Caribbean, countries are moving towards decarbonizing their power grids. The progress is slow, but steady. Some may say too slow. The major hindrance is the lack of resources. Even the wealthiest countries in the Caribbean do not have a fraction of the resources at the disposal of the world's developed nations. Greater regional access to funding in the form of loans and grants is essential. We must work closely with the US and international funding agencies to generate the necessary capital investments to make a future powered by renewable energy possible. As for US Caribbean engagement of this issue, greater investments in the Caribbean Energy Security Initiative is a good place to start to provide the necessary financial and technical support. Next to climate resilience, the need for more resilient agri-food systems looms large for the region. CARICOM's research suggests that as much as 50%, 57% of the English-speaking Caribbean faces food security issues. The region has seen across the board food inflation in double digits over the past two years. Global supply chain issues have elevated food security as a huge, huge issue in our region. In the Bahamas, we are intending and we are investing over $100 million in food production and security in the form of climate smart grants, land grants, research, and the provisions of infrastructural support through packing houses, abattoirs, and other public funded facilities. Countries like Belize are investing in significantly boosting agricultural production. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the, the innovative OECS Agriculture Competitiveness Project is linking domestic farms to opportunities within the local tourism market. In Jamaica, their work continues to expand and diversify food exports. The Caribbean is prime to take big leaps forward in agriculture, but we need access to funding. We also need technical support and access to research. There are potential opportunities for investments to be explored as capital is needed to aggressively expand many of these projects at scale. The $28 million provided by the U.S. government through the Zero Hunger Caribbean Plan was a step in the right direction. Training sessions offered by the EPA have proven useful to regional stakeholders, and the advisory and the technical, technical support of U.S. aid has been invaluable. We look forward to the completion of the long-term action plan being developed jointly by CARICOM and USAID, which will provide a strategic roadmap for future food security initiatives. Across the region, across the region, financial inclusion has emerged as a major issue. The loss of correspondent banking relationships is a trend that is universally observed as international banks embrace leaner business models 
and prioritize profitability. The immediate impact has been on remittances, as sending and receiving money internationally has been made more difficult. The lack of integration with global financial systems is a major threat to countries like Guyana, Haiti, and Jamaica, which all have large diasporic populations across the globe. Each of these countries receive inflows from international remittances, which make up over 10% of their national GDP. For Haiti, for example, it is over 20%. Ultimately, this trend has negatively impacted the region's ability to trade internationally, and the resulting impact on the ease of doing business serves as an additional barrier to foreign direct investments. For many people, access itself is the issue. In the Bahamas, on some less populated islands, people have been left without a single commercial bank on the island. In response, we have embraced innovation as we facilitate the use of digital transaction portals and launch the world's first central bank digital currency. However, until these solutions see widespread adoption, the issue remains. There are millions of unbanked people in the Caribbean and Latin America, and a gender gap with women less likely to own a bank account. For many lower income people, as well as small and micro businesses, cost is a factor. 60% of unbanked adults in Latin America and the Caribbean cite cost as a barrier to financial services. The Caribbean Initiative Financial Inclusion Task Force is a conduit for solving these persistent issues. We are supportive of the task force general recommendations to pool regional transactions to increase potential revenues for banks, as well as the need to bring smaller nations together with correspondent banks to build stronger relationships and develop country-specific solutions. Addressing the costs related to compliance with AML and CFT standards by creating uniform regional standards represents an opportunity to lower costs for banks while coming up with a fair and balanced approach to these standards. It is clear that there's no lack of challenges within this region, in our region. Fortunately, where there are challenges, there are opportunities. Before us, we have an opportunity to make historic advancements in regional, and regional energy security, food security, and financial inclusion, while ensuring that the, pro the progress we make is not erased in the long run by climate change. Our work can save lives and livelihoods as we build a brighter future for our community of nations. I thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for those excellent remarks. And again, wonderful to have you in Washington, although I, I know it's always better in the Bahamas. It is. Uh, but still great to, great to have you here. Hopefully our next conversation will be in the Bahamas. But this, is, this conversation, the priorities that you outlined just now uh, will go to the root of the conversation that we will, we will now have, but go to the importance, the increasing importance of the Caribbean and of the U.S. relationship with the Caribbean moving forward, which is, as you, as you mentioned, why we started, why uh, Melanie founded the Caribbean Initiative within the Adrian Arch Latin America Center. It, it, over the course of the last year, we've seen a lot of attention from the U.S. government. We've seen the Biden administration frequently noting uh, over the course of the last year that they were in listening mode uh, with regard to engagement with Caribbean leaders, and that listening mode had led to, has led to a number of advancements that we've seen over the, over the course of the last year, from the announcement of the U.S. partnership to address the Climate Crisis 2030, otherwise known as PAC 2030, mm -hmm. uh, which is geared toward energy and climate, energy and, and climate uh, resilience, and so we'll talk about that in a few moments. Uh, but we also saw a number uh, of Caribbean uh, other uh, heads of state and heads of government. Uh, we saw five heads of state and government travel to Washington for bilateral meetings 
uh, with U.S. officials. And so uh, as we enter 2023, the question is uh, what, what, what needs to be done and what more can be done to move some of these issues forward? So I want to uh, engage a conversation with you on a few of the different topics that you raised um, from energy to climate change to economic growth. But first begin, uh, you met, uh, I think, just a couple hours ago yeah. uh, with uh, Vice President Harris. Uh, and I would assume that many of these topics came up, probably also in addition to the topic of, of migration, since we saw uh, just over the weekend uh, 17 migrants that were uh, rescued by a cruise ship uh, en route to the Bahamas. Uh, and we've also seen over the course of the last year the number of Cuban migrants to the Bahamas uh, significantly increase. Can you start with a, a readout of uh, what you're able to share, of your readout of your conversation with the vice president, uh, and also what you are hoping for and so far as follow-up from that conversation? <laughs> yes, we had a very fruitful and engaging conversation on a, on a variety of topics. Uh, that uh, that were, Those topics were geared to, first of all, um, have collaboration, cooperation between our countries and the Caribbean, firstly. And secondly, to see, to see through some of the initiatives that we have been talking about for far too long. Mm -hmm. as, as I would have mentioned back at the Summit of Americas, nature abhors a vacuum. And if the U.S. is not close to us, uh, they are not our partners, it leaves a vacuum. And nature will fill it. And over the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's being filled by what I call a country um, that the U.S. have some geopolitical issues with. But as I continue to say, that nature abhors a vacuum. And if attention is not paid, someone else will pay the attention. So I'm very gratified by the fact that the U.S. <coughs> has reengaged us. As I mentioned, we are neighbors. And we are a community. And we've been such for, from time immemorial. Um, we are kit and kin. And um, to just to not engage us, um, to assist us. And because we have shared challenges, many of the challenges in the United States, we find in our own countries. And the difference between us and the United States that they are better able to defend against some of those challenges. They are better equipped to, to overcome some of those challenges. For us, we need help to do so. As I mentioned, in respect, for example, the consequence of climate change that our islands are experiencing. And, um, and so it was quite a, an engaging conversation with the um, Vice President this morning. And I look forward to uh, the commitments um, provided during the course of those conversations. Just a follow-up, Prime Minister. Um, what, what do you see as, as success uh, coming uh, from, this, from this trip? What do you hope to return to the Bahamas uh, having, having accomplished following the meeting with the Vice President and some of your other meetings that you'll be having in Washington? Well, nothing, nothing is always immediate. Um, what, 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 I, what I carry back is the fact that uh, I think uh, the fact that we're able to meet one-on-one, -on -one, face to face we have been able to develop a relationship or at least a start a relationship that will all go well for the future. We, we were able to commit to each other, uh, working together, collaborating together to, um, to, to address our challenges. And there's been a commitment to, to identify ways and means of assisting us um, through, through grant fundings and loans to, to address a number of our challenges. I know a number of people in our in-studio audience here are, are also um, working very hard to address and advance that relationship. I want to turn to a couple of the different topics that you mentioned in your, your remarks previously, financial <laughs> inclusion, uh, climate issues, mm -hmm. energy, uh, but maybe beginning with, with financial inclusion and uh, uh, appreciate your recognition of the work of the Caribbean Initiatives Financial yeah. Inclusion mm -hmm. Task Force and, and our focus over the last couple of years on the real challenge of, of, of de-risking. Uh, yes. you, as, you, as you mentioned, there's uh, islands within, within your country that are left without a single commercial bank, which is uh, a pretty stark reality. Mm -hmm. um, as, we, as, we, as we look to this year, we're also planning on launching at the Atlantic Council our Caribbean Initiative, a U.S. Caribbean banking forum to further elevate solutions to address financial de-risking. One thing we've seen, though, is we've seen also the extent to which perceptions about offshore banking and financial center and financial centers, how those perceptions affect decisions. 
And Mr. Prime Minister, you're seeing this again following the arrest in the Bahamas uh, of Sam Bankman Freed as the world's eyes turn to your country. What steps is your country taking to work with U.S. regulatory bodies following the, this connection to the Bahamas? And what are some of your lessons moving forward? Well, the, the, the FTX challenge is nothing new. Um, there would have been um, collaboration between our regulatory bodies, uh, between both countries before in other similar instances where banks collapsed back in the day um, and uh, major international, multinational companies would have collapsed and we would have cooperated in, in, in that area. The difference here is that we were, we were in a different space, uh, the crypto digital space. Unfortunately, we do have a legislative regime that, was, that is in place. Um, our, our regulatory body worked uh, very closely with the U.S. regulatory bodies in all these, uh, in various matters. They collaborate um, very often in matters of concern that, that's cross-border issues. And so when the FTX uh, issue arose, it was, um, <clears throat> it was because of our, reg our regulatory regime that allowed us to move quickly to preserve assets for, for participants in, in the FTX um, business. And we were able to move quickly, more quickly than even the US. Mm. Um, and, I, and I dare say that perhaps our regulatory regime in respect to this space is probably more modern than the US. And so um, you would have found that the, the CEO that was appointed after the, the Chapter 11 filings eventually had to come around yeah. to accept that what we were doing, what we had done, was appropriate and perhaps has saved the day for many of the investors in the FTX. But we continue to work with our, with our regulatory partners around the world to ensure, because at the end of the day, the, the regulatory regime is to keep out bad actors, to protect investors, and to ensure that the integrity of our jurisdiction maintains um, its uh, property. Well, thank you for that. One of, one of the points you mentioned in your opening is the, the loss of correspondent relations is additional barrier to foreign direct investment, which is something that we've heard consistently over the two years of our Financial Inclusion Task Force. And as we look to 2023, looking at how do, how do we help to either um, prevent further de-risking or to bring new financial relationships, or and both, frankly, uh, to the Caribbean? From your perspective, what strategies um, do you, what strategies are are, are you and, and other Caribbean leaders taking to address this issue? And, and at the same time, what kind of support? What would you like to see from the United States uh, to help to further address this incredible challenge? I think often flies under the radar screen, but is yeah. so vital to your country. Yeah, part of this, part of the issue is that governments could only do so much. We we could um, we could help regulate and we could help um, set the stage in the atmosphere to make to make to make it um, profitable for banks to operate. They are all private. Uh, sector entities, and unfortunately, their bottom line has, is what they are mo most concerned about. The common good usually suffers um, because of the the targeted um, and aggressive approach to ensuring that the profit, that your profit margin rises. I think one of the strategies has to be to instill in the corporate, the banking corporate world their obligation to the common good. And that, that profitability is usually tied to how, how well all around you is doing. And all around you could only do well if you are concerned about the common good. And um, so our strategy is, to, con is to, to seek to talk with the private bankers um, in the Caribbean, we've been talking about pooling resources too, because again, when you look at the size of the Caribbean, in our country, we have, what, we have 400,000 um, um, Bahamian citizens, but of course, we have a, a large uh, segment of uh, 
residents who uh, are foreign who live in the country. Um, but um, if we could persuade um, the institutions to pay less attention to their profit line and, um, and pay more attention to the common good, and at the same time, letting them recognize that the common good will improve their common, their profit level. Oh, and it goes back to your point and some of the issues we've been working on, pooling transactions Pool as transactions well, down. right, to, to have greater reward mm -hmm. and mitigate, elevate the reward to, to mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. let, let me, in the interest of time, let me move on to energy and, and then, and then uh, have an opportunity to talk, talk climate as well. Mm -hmm. um, partially due to Russia's war in Ukraine, the cost of energy has significantly risen. And for Caribbean countries, this has been particularly challenging as most CARICOM members are import dependent on meeting their energy needs. Mm -hmm. um, our recently, our Caribbean initiative and also the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, we launched the first phase of our Caribbean Energy Working Group, which will prioritize so solutions that support regional energy security. My question is, with most Caribbean con consumers paying some of the highest electricity prices, frankly, in the hemisphere, what steps can the Bahamas and other Caribbean countries take to make electricity more affordable for your, for your citizens? And, 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 and how, what, what in your role, in your mind, could be the role of the United States in helping to, to move that forward? Yeah, well, again, the, um, I want to thank the Atlantic Council for their initiative in attempting to help us address this issue of energy uh, security. Um, one of the issues that we have is that is the 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 blockade on Venezuela um, that shares a gas field with uh, Trinidad and Tobago that they would wish to exploit, but as being hampered in doing so, because if they do so, um, Trinidad is willing to help its sister countries in 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 lowering the cost of fuel to, to them. Um, but <coughs> I think <coughs> um, the alternative energy is the answer uh, because it has been found, it's been said that to, to develop a new, uh, to develop uh, a, uh, an oil field is much more expensive than putting up sol a solar farm. But again, for countries like ours, it's still the cost. While we are taking care of our debt, that's associated with climate change, which we have to, and, and at the same time looking after the needs of our, our citizens, we have to, 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 to pivot to alternative energy like solar that I'm attempting to do. Mm -hmm. It's a costly exercise. So I welcome the PAC. 2030 that the U.S. have entered into, where they have prioritized lending technical assistance, providing financing for alternative energy, and so we're hoping to explore that aspect, and hopefully we'll stop talking mm -hmm. and start executing and acting. Thank you. Well, let me shift in, uh, to the to PAC 2030 and shift to uh, policies to future region U.S. policy to future for future regional development. And PAC 2030 is, I think, one of the many, probably one of the greatest successes of the Sum of the Americas was the yes, announcement sir. of the PAC 2030. And the first time for quite some time, you have a dedicated U.S. policy uh, to helping the Caribbean countries in what is frankly one of the, one of the most or, or the most important issues. Um, and we will be launching a working group this year dedicated to supporting the implementation of PAC 2030 here uh, at the uh, Caribbean issue of the Asian Arts Latin America Center. Uh, and continue to also raise the importance of the regionals. They'll help to continue to raise the importance with U.S. stakeholders. Um, you mentioned in your comments beforehand about the importance of more access to climate funding. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of a climate resilient future. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, over the next year, um, what could, what should Caribbean countries do, or how can the U.S. optimally work with Caribbean countries in implementation? Uh, of PAC 2030 to be able to set, set the road for the future insofar as how to better financing of climate adaptation and mitigation. Yeah. <coughs> what many of our countries are doing is moving to like an alternative energy, in particular solarizing, to, uh, solarizing its, energy, its energy source. And so many of us are doing it, but only incrementally, because as I said, a barrier to a complete and successive 
successful pivot to solar is cost and, and is prohibitive for many of our countries. Um, in the meantime, <clears throat> um, what we are doing is what we do best, continue to knock on the doors, continue to speak up about it, and letting our voices heard um, on this issue of um, climate financing. So f um, access to financing now, climate financing in particular, they have a particular, they have criteria. One of which, for example, is the per capita of, of, a, of a country. Uh, if you look at the per capita income that sets a bar, many of the Caribbean countries do not qualify. And so we have been, we, we have been, um, we've been for the last, well, I'd say from the Samoa pathway in 2015, when I was in Samoa, we've been talking about changing the criteria. They have come up with this process, with this criteria called the multi-vulnerability index, to, to, and which is to be adopted by the, the multilateral banks for lending. But again, it's been talked for a long time, mm. but it's yet to be implemented. And so if we can get that done, we could change the criteria, how we could access funds, um, uh, access grants, that no doubt will be able to help to cut the Caribbean along the way. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I want to also, as, as chair of CARICOM, uh, as you look to the region, you look at the regions, uh, I'm always an optimist, we'll say the opportunities, but also the many challenges that the, that, that the uh, Caribbean region faces. What would you optimally, how would you optimally see the international community and the United States leaning in further on some of the greatest, in addition to climate, energy, uh, we haven't talked about the challenges that Haiti, for example, presents to the region. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I omitted to speak to that, um, and that is very high on uh, my agenda. Um, we have been attempting for the last six months to come up with, with a regional <coughs> response to the issues that's happening in Haiti. Um, I've been in conversations with, with, um, with the U.S. and Canada, and um, it is this... I host within the next three weeks to CARICOM heads, uh, the prime, the premier, uh, prime minister of Canada, is likely to be with us, and we hopefully will be able to craft a response. But that it is a truly a challenging issue, particularly for the Bahamas, because we are in the, we're in what I call the migratory route to the United States, and many don't get there; they just stay right in the Bahamas. And again, with our own meager resources. We are called upon to respond both compassionately um, uh, to that crisis, and at the same time, we have to balance that with with what's happening in my own country, because um, they are they get a bit phobic over the issue of being overwhelmed by uh, persons who are not from our country, and so that that's a balancing act. But Haiti is an issue. We feel that <coughs> that that. The, the challenges in Haiti has to be solved. It has to be a Haitian solution, and a, and a solution not just for the short term, but that could be sustained, because all the you know this is this will not be the first time. There have been interventions before, and it, it lasts for four or five years, and we need to have a, a long-lasting, sustainable solution to the Haitian crisis, Haitian problems, which is Haitian um, driven. I, I couldn't agree more and also couldn't agree more on the fact that the challenges in Haiti are uh, go far beyond Haiti yeah, as yes, well, does, and yes. extend to the greater Caribbean and frankly to the US, the US shores as, as well. Uh, it goes back to our conversation earlier about the, the 17 migrants that were uh, yes, yeah. picked up by a cruise ship just this past weekend off the coast of the Bahamas. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I want to, again, uh, thank you for coming. It's been my pleasure, and it's been indeed a wonderful thing. I just again want to thank uh, the initiative of the Atlantic Council. Um, definitely, I look forward to working hand in hand with you to achieve some of the objectives I have during my short term as chairperson. I, this will not be, you'll not be hearing from me for the first time, you'll be hearing from us again. I, I we look forward to doing so. I'm very excited to have this conversation just a couple of weeks into your term as chair of CARICOM so that we have our, 
uh, six, uh, five and a half months to continue to follow up on CARICOM and, of course, work together uh, with, through the Atlantic Council on, on Bahamas priorities. And as we said in the outset, better, better in the Bahamas. And so look forward yes. to our next look, conversation okay. there. Great seeing you, Jason. Thank it's you so much. It's my pleasure. And again, thank you all for joining us today for this Atlantic Council front page. Look forward to our next AC front page conversation. <laughs>